It is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Rice Culture Project, the Georgetown Public Library, of course, Dwight for being such a wonderful host. Um, and it is interesting that we are thinking about questions of interconnectedness uh, between rice and agriculture and the arts at a time when so many of our museums are undergoing major transformations. It's sort of this perfect moment to not only be talking about these things, but to actually have the ability to then see them physically create themselves in the interpretation that we're going to move forward with uh, over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. As some of you may know, this year marks Mezda's 50th anniversary. It was 50 years ago that this man, Frank Horton, and his mother, Theo Tolliver, decided to create a museum dedicated to the study, exhibition, and research of Southern decorative arts. Now, Frank Horton had been heavily involved in the restoration of Old Salem, the historic Moravian town in Win that forms the core of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And so when the opportunity came to transfer, to take over this old Kroger grocery store at the end of Main Street and turn it into a museum dedicated to Southern art, well, Frank took that idea and ran with it. Now, when Mazda opened 50 years ago, it was very much what you would have expected of a decorative arts museum of its era. It was very much in the mid-century model of places like the Winneter Museum or Bayou Bend or even the period rooms at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and elsewhere. We had beautiful rooms filled with beautiful things the way they might have looked as if the beautiful people had just temporarily left and <laughs> headed out in their crinolines under the piazzas, <laughs> leaving us to just have a peek into the elegant lives they lived. Of course, this was only part of the picture, because for every wealthy planter um, whose material wealth was uh, on display in the museum, there were the many other people who made that lifestyle possible. There were, of course, the craftsmen, the um, overseers, but just as importantly, there were the many, many thousands of enslaved laborers who worked the land and who made that lifestyle completely possible. And the reality is you can't talk about Southern decorative arts, Southern history, Southern culture, without recognizing the important role that enslaved human beings played in making that possible. Indeed, there's a concept called object biography in which you sort of uh, write the biography of an object. You cannot write the biography of these southern objects without recognizing that intertwined with their biographies are the biographies of these oftentimes unnamed individuals who nonetheless were incredibly important in both the creation and using of these objects. Now, the idea that there was this rich tapestry behind every object was something that Frank Horton uh, certainly recognized. Because one of the really neat things about the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts is that we're more than just a museum. We're more than just an exhibition space where great things are collected, put on pedestals, and displayed. We are in many ways, and this is just as important to our mission, we are in many ways a research facility and library. Less than a decade after Frank Horton established the museum, he established the Mesda Research Center. Now, Frank was never one to set small goals, so here was his goal. We were going to read every newspaper, every will, and every inventory from all of Mesda's seven states 
from the period of first settlement to the civil uh, to 1820 that we now read to the Civil War. We're going to read everything. Now, of course, the Civil War meant there was slightly less to read than there might have been, but still, it's an ongoing project to this day, and it's a project we expect to continue for at least another quarter century. Now, what Frank's idea was, was to get all these documents on microfilm, carefully read through them, and every time he would find a Southern craftsman to create a note card about that craftsman. Every reference to every craftsman in every document he could find. Today, those note cards number more than 250,000. They document the lives of more than 80,000 Southern craftsmen working in more than 127 different trades. And what's really wonderful is that not only do they exist in these filing Hello. <laughs> in those filing cabinets, they also exist online at mesda.org where you can actually completely text search each and every one of those records. Now what's neat is Frank did this research project with the help of many, many others in a way that was completely colorblind. It did not matter if you were free or enslaved black or white or Native American, male or female, if you showed evidence of practicing one of these 127 different trades, you got a card, you got an entry, you got recognized, your name got added to the database. To date, we've actually documented 6,500 slave-owning craftsmen. We've identified more than 1,000 free craftsmen of color, and I think most impressively, we've actually been able to identify more than 3,000 enslaved craftsmen by name. So when I came to MESDA from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2007, I was challenged by our chief curator to mine this database and to create an exhibition that would look at the role of free and enslaved craftsmen of color using the more than quarter century worth of research we had in our files. I called the show Black and White All Mixed Together, The Hidden Legacy of Enslaved Craftsmen, and the show had a very simple premise. And that was that for every image in our mind of a solitary master craftsman personally creating every object we then so, so highly prize, there were dozens of hidden hands at work behind the scenes. And my goal was to push our visitors to see some of the most iconic objects in our collection in a completely new way and to ask the question, who really made it? Whose hidden hands are behind the mark of the master craftsman? And so I thought, what are the most iconic objects in the collection? And I realized that it had just been a year before that the museum had been the lone exhibitor at the Winter Antique Show in New York City. And that January, the magazine Antiques had actually given Mesda the entire issue to celebrate the museum. On the cover were three objects, two of which ended up featuring prominently in the exhibit. You don't get any more iconic than that. There was, for example, this tea table, this carved tea table from the Rappahannock River Valley of Virginia, a table made by the Scottish immigrant craftsman Robert Walker for Charles Carter of Cleve, a son of uh, Robert King Carter of uh, Quartoman. Um, we know from the documentary records that Robert Walker actually took not only white apprentices, but at times would allow those white apprentices to bring their enslaved craftsmen with them to also train. And what was so fascinating is that in these legal documents, Walker very clearly sets out the different terms for training a free or an enslaved craftsman where you get to eat, what you get to eat, whether during certain seasons you, the enslaved craftsman, may actually be sent out into the field to help pick uh, um, 
agricultural products. Um, and that the enslaved craftsmen receiving the same training would actually be, in a sense, indentured to the craftsmen for one additional year. Another great example was this salver. It's marked three times on its back AP for Alexander Petrie. Petrie was a Scottish craftsman, a Scottish silversmith in Charleston, South Carolina. When Petrie died in 1768, his estate advertises that he actually owns, among other enslaved individuals, a silversmith. And when, it's, when, his, invent, when his estate sells, when his estate sells, the single most valuable asset he owns is Abraham, a silversmith, who sells to a rival silversmith, Jonathan Sarazin, for 810 pounds. That was the single most valuable asset Alexander Petrie owned. And so it forces you to ask the question, when you see these three AP marks on the back of this salver, you know, who's really in the shop doing the work? Whose hands are on these objects? And what other stories can we tell because of that? Now, it would have been very easy when the exhibit closed after six months to have let the lessons we learned just sort of go away, to say, all right, we've done the diversity exhibit now. <laughs> we'll put it on our website. If anybody asks why we're not doing more about it, we'll say we did it. Check. And we'll go back to beautiful rooms, beautiful people, beautiful things, beautiful stories, and we're done. We didn't do that. We did put it on the website. You can go visit the website, mesda.org, and see the show. But we actually took the stories with the objects back into the collection. You know, the way you experience Mesda is on a guided tour. And when these objects went back out of our small temporary exhibition gallery, and into their homes in the collection, our guides, our interpreters, really took these stories back with them and continued to interpret them along these different uh, routes than we had always done before. Now, it also came at a perfect time because we were getting ready to embark on a six-year, $1.5 million rejuvenation of the entire collection, all the study rooms because it really hadn't happened. You know, I love this comparison. Uh, this is Criss Cross Hall, Mesda's gallery dedicated to the earliest Southern objects in the collection, the 17th century. In 1967, the magazine Antiques did a great article about Mesda, this new museum. In 2007, the magazine Antiques did a great article about Mesda, <laughs> this new museum. And Forty years later, the two rooms barely look different, though I think the fake flowers finally died. <laughs> Other than that, nothing had changed, which is why we were in the process of getting the museum ready for the next 50 years and why today the room looks like this. New lighting. I can't tell you how important new lighting is. New exhibition techniques, the idea that objects can actually be in the middle of the rooms, up on platforms, able to walk around, but also that you don't have to just explore the objects from sort of a pretty and domestic point of view, but that really, in our collection, every object can speak to one of what we teach our guides, four key storylines. You know, obviously, there is a story of style. Style is important when you're looking at art and decorative arts. But there are equally important stories. There are stories of craftsmen and craftsmanship. We are, after all, a museum with a quarter of a million index cards about craftsmen. There are stories of settlement and migration. How do people get where they're going? Because that tells you a lot about why objects look the way they do. And finally, there are always stories about race and ethnicity tied up into every single object. Those four key themes went to influence how we went and redid all of our rooms. And what's great is that in about five weeks, we are going to complete the renovation of all 30 of our study galleries. 
but there's more. When I mentioned that the old way you would see Mazda was on a uh, hour and a half long guided tour, um, that automatically changed the kind of visitor who would come and engage with these kinds of stories we were telling. We were forcing our audience to radically self-select themselves. So we're actually getting ready to open 3,000 square feet of new self-guided gallery space. And this is where our ability to really work with our visitors to understand this rich and sometimes uncomfortable tapestry is really going to happen. For example, one of the new galleries is the William C. and Susan S. Mariner Southern Ceramics Gallery. Bill and Susan are great collectors. They've built one of the finest collections of Southern Ceramics anywhere. When you take their collection and put it with Mezda's collection, what you really have is the story of the South in clay. And it's a story you can't tell without having to touch on race in some very important ways. We're in the midst of installation. This is a photo I shot just the other day. And there are two pots in here that I think illustrate that story better than any. Right here, one is Mezda's great Dave signed poetical pot, and the other is a less known but I think equally important object made by a potter in Alexandria, Virginia named David Jarbour. And what you're actually looking at here on the right side is, is, a, is an elevation we call faith, war, and freedom. All about how faith and war ultimately lead to freedom for people like David Jarbour or David Drake. Now, of course, I think everybody in this room is familiar with the story of David Drake, uh, an enslaved potter in Edgefield, South Carolina, a man who at a time when learning to read and write is uh, questionably legal among the enslaved population, learns to do both, and then flaunts it, almost like an affidavit, you know, on his pots. Here's who I am. Here's when I'm doing it. Here's proof that I can write. And here's my owner. And he writes his biography in clay. Of all the thousands of enslaved potters working in the Edgefield District, Dave is the only one who literally speaks to us through his pots. And so this monumental poetical jar actually sits in the middle of a section dedicated to Edgefield, South Carolina pottery, in which it's one of more than two dozen examples made by Dave's fellow pottery plantation slaves. It's an incredible object and one that you can now really engage with or will be able to really engage with when the new galleries open at the end of October. This jar, lesser known, is by an Alexandria, Virginia potter named David Jarbour. It's signed on the bottom, uh, 1830, Alexa uh, for Alexandria, made by D. Jarbour. David Jarbour was actually born into slavery in Alexandria, Virginia. He learned to be a potter. In 1820, he was able to purchase his freedom. He continued to work in the Alexandria potteries after that point. And by 1830, 10 years into freedom, he actually had the opportunity to become the head potter at the factory where he was working. We suspect that this pot, dated 1830, the same time that job became open, may sort of be his opus, his, his statement of, I have the skill to take on this position uh, and to become a master potter, uh, just as I also had the skill and wherewithal to become a free man. These stories also are important in the new uh, Carolyn and Mike McNamara Southern Masterworks Gallery the main introductory galleries to the new Mezda. The stories of black and white, rich and poor, free and enslaved, all of these stories are woven together in this space. There are, of course, objects like these portraits. These are portraits painted by Joshua Johnson. Joshua Johnson was, a, was born into slavery, becomes a free man, becomes a painter, in Baltimore. He really goes on to paint Baltimore's emerging merchant middle class, including people like um, the Yo family, seen here. He's an incredible story, an incredible artist. And these are the kind of masterworks that we wanted to put forward to our visitors to sort of upend their expectations of what it meant to be a Southern object. 
But I want to conclude with an object that I think actually for this audience is going to be very close to home, but perfectly illustrates how we've taken the lessons of the black and white all mixed together exhibit back in 2007, 2008, and use it to really influence all that we do in the museum. This sideboard was actually not made far from here. It was made in Georgetown, South Carolina in the very early part of the 19th century. And it perfectly exemplifies how our approach to objects has changed. When it came into the collection in 1965, the most important thing about it, other than the fact that it's elegant and beautiful, was that it had an Alston family connection. And we could play up this connection to the wealthy Alston family, their associations with governors, both colonial and antebellum, uh, their plantation lifestyle. All of these things were important. Less important were trying to figure out exactly who made it uh, or even uh, bringing the object to life by thinking through the many hands that were required both to make it but also to put it into service. Every summer we host a summer institute. We bring some of the brightest young minds in uh, American decorative arts, history, public history, art history to the museum for a month to study and think about Southern decorative arts and material culture. And this past summer was our Low Country Summer, and this is one of the objects we suggested a student take on. And indeed she did. And one of the first questions we asked was, uh, could you figure out maybe who made it? What would the outline of the person who made it be? Well, they had to be in Georgetown, about 1800. They had to know how to make a sideboard. So we did a little bit of searching in the Craftsman database. And this is the one man who sort of fit that bill, Peter Cooper. Peter Cooper, 1812, dies in Georgetown. He's a cabinet maker. Not a lot to go on. There are probably lots of cabinet makers in Georgetown. This one just happened to die and get picked up in our, in our record search. But when we dug a little deeper, we found that Peter Cooper actually trained with this man, Alexander Calder, in Charleston. Now, Calder is one of Charleston's most important uh, neoclassical cabinet makers and is a, is a man in whose, uh, invent in whose advertisements sideboards of all kinds are routinely advertised. So here you have an orphan who's apprenticed to Calder who we know is making sideboards who then runs away to Georgetown where he then dies in 1812. Right place, right time, right training possibly the right person. So that's certainly one aspect. The ability to potentially connect this poor orphan becoming a craftsman, coming to Georgetown, making this object for one of the wealthiest rice planters in South Carolina. But the other part of this object that we're interpreting in the new gallery is the idea that the object's history doesn't just stop with its manufacture and purchase, but that it's actually a key object for the enslaved people that the Alston family um, possesses. That this is an object from which they are then serving and orchestrating and creating meals. It's an object made with them in mind as much as the master, whether it's to keep them out, to keep them in, to make their service work, to make their service not, but that the biography of this object is just as rich and just as important and so on the object label, in the introductory hallway to the exhibit, it is made very clear that this object exists not just because of a craftsman and a consumer, but also because of an entire economic system that you can't tease out of the early American South. The reality is Southern history is a rich tapestry, and that tapestry has uncomfortable parts. It has wonderful parts. It has beautiful parts, but it has all of these bits and pieces. And so as we have worked to create a new Mazda, to expand Frank Horton's vision into the 21st century, we've worked very hard to make sure that that tapestry is as representative as it possibly 
can be. So I invite you all to please, at the end of October or any time after that, to please come to MESDA to come visit the collection and see what we've done to make sure that we're telling the story of not just one South, one type of Southerner, but as much as we can trying to tell the story of the whole South and the many Southerners who are part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.